My task uh, here, and I'm going to get to my first slide here, uh, was really to discuss the non-operative therapy. So uh, Dr. Harrop has really gone through fairly nicely reviewing the literature uh, with regards to um, operative uh, treatment. I wanted to now um, uh, look at basically non-operative therapy of these odontoid fractures, really in, you know, again, focusing on the elderly and looking at the case that was presented to us. So this octogenarian that comes into your emergency room with an acute, this, uh, with an acute, let's look at it more from an acute standpoint, a dotoid fracture, uh, what is the most appropriate treatment for them? And, you know, as um, uh, Dr. Harrop was alluding to, uh, we know that these fractures are common. They're one of the most common cervical spine fractures we've seen. And in the elderly, it may be the most common isolated spine fracture in this in this elderly population. And we're probably seeing more of these. Probably every one of us on the phone is not infrequent that we see these patients come to the emergency room. And this octogenarian population is growing and growing fairly rapidly. It may double by 2025. So this is a big problem uh, and really important uh, aspect in why we're having this webinar tonight uh, because it isn't clear how to treat these patients. And we know that when this is, comes from Smith's paper, um, looking at the age group of these fractures is that, you know, these patients, you know, are, are in, you know, from falls are commonly in the octogenarian population. So hence, again, looking at, at this, why are we, you know, why we're presenting this webinar tonight. Uh, because it's common in this in this age group. Um, now, uh, um, as Dr. Harrop related to or, or uh, pointed out, is these patients have a very elevated morbidity and mortality. If you look at just patients older than 80, surgery or no surgery, you know they have about a 35% morbidity. Uh, and they have a 15% mortality. So this is a bad problem, regardless of how you treat it. And here's a quote right out of that orthopedic paper. This came out of Jefferson. But again, looking at these patients have a high morbidity and mortality, regardless of how you treat them. So it's a big problem, and we really need to think very carefully how we treat these patients. And again, as been pointed out, there are no randomized controlled trials out there that guide uh, our treatment out there. From a Cochrane review, there is no evidence available from adequately controlled trials to tell us which way to go with these patients. From Harrop's own review, uh, and he said it, uh, and he said it tonight. When they looked at the literature, the majority of the literature out there is a very low quality. And of the papers that they found that were reasonable, only four were of low quality. So all of the so all of the evidence that's out there is really a very, very low quality when trying to make some decision on what's the best way uh, to treat to treat these patients. But you know, one way to treat them is not surgery, but it is non-operative uh, non-operative care. And I think things we've got to think about, and probably all of us do when we're looking at these elderly type patients trying to decide, you know, can we treat them non-operatively or surgically? Is what are their associated other injuries that they have, if they have any? How sick are they? What are their medical comorbidities? What's their Asia grade? Uh, what is the stability of the fracture or what is the potential healing potential of the fracture? Is it displaced? Uh, is it comminuted? Uh, can this patient even tolerate uh, going to surgery? Do, do you feel that they can tolerate it? Does the patient want surgery? Maybe they don't have, they don't want anything to do with surgery. Many octogenarians don't even want to talk about having surgery. And really, what are the risks of that surgery versus the morbidity associated with prolonged immobilization? And really, that's the purpose of the talk uh, that I'm going to present here. And I think when you look at non-operative therapy here, you really got to ask yourself, well, why not non-operative therapy in this 80-year-old patient? Why not just put him in a brace? Well, if you look at the arguments against it, and, and, I, and Harrop presented these, you know, one, one of the arguments is there's low fusion rates. The other argument is these patients develop late myelopathy if you wait long enough. Uh, another argument is these patients have a higher morbidity and mortality compared to surgical patients. The surgical patients do better. And then lastly, halos are really a death sentence. So, we, you know, we need to operate on them. So I really want to look at each one of these individually and look at some of the literature out there and let's try to see how true... Uh, uh, some of these uh, claims are. And let's start first with fusion rates. You know, the fusion rates are low, and that, that is a truth, and we know that. Everybody knows that on the phone, that the fusion rates, uh, non-operative elderly odontoid fractures is low. It's a wide range reported anywhere from, say, 20 to 50%, maybe a little bit more with a halo, maybe a little less with a rigid collar. 
I think the point here, however, is not how low the fusion rate. I think is we're looking at the, law, the wrong endpoint. I think we're asking the wrong question. It may not be that important to get a solid fusion in an 85-year-old versus if you've got a 22-year-old with an odontoid fracture. These are two vastly different patient populations. I'm not sure if looking at a fusion rate in this population is that important. So that's why I'm saying no, you probably don't have to achieve a solid fusion in these patients. So this may not be that important uh, to get a 100% union rate. I think a stable non-union in these patients in the, in the octogenarian pop population is acceptable. And really what do I mean by a stable non-union? I mean there's no evidence of bony fusion on the CAT scan. But there's really no or minimal movement on flexion extension x-rays. The patient has no neurological symptoms and really has no neck pain. That kind of defines a stable non-union, and I would say that's an acceptable outcome in these patients. Now, what about the literature? What does the literature show from this? And some of this was discussed already, but here's a study by Hannigan et al. looking at odontoid fractures in the elderly. These were 19 patients, again, 80 years of age. These are octogenarians mainly. They had nine patients out of this cohort treated with a collar. The follow-up was about 28 months, okay, so, you know, moderate follow-up. Half their patients went on to a solid union, and four, though, developed a stable non-union. And overall, overall that follow-up period, there was no late neurological deterioration. And these patients, again, stable non-union, asymptomatic, back to, their, back to their, you know, their lifestyle, but no late neurological deterioration. Uh, Ryan and Taylor's papers quoted a lot, 29 patients, type 2 odontoid fractures. These were treated non-operatively. Now, some of these were halos, so their union rate is a little bit higher at 77%, but they followed them for an average of 20 month, 21 months and no late myelopathy in these patients. Back to normal activities, and a quote right from that paper is, vigorous attempts to secure both primary union and a sound orthrodesis for a non-union are questionable in the elderly except, except in unusual circumstances. So again, paper showing that a stable non-union is an acceptable outcome. There's a couple other papers, even the Mueller paper, looking at 19 patients with type 2 odontoid fractures. They're a little bit younger, average age 59, hard collar, higher union rate, 77%. But if you include in that from that study their stable asymptomatic fibrous unions, the favorable outcome and success rates up to 92%. They found no correlation between radiological findings and clinical outcomes and concluded that non-union of the odontoid could be stable without clinical symptoms and therefore does not necessarily imply a poor clinical outcome. So again, I think this study shows that a stable non-union can be an acceptable outcome in these octogenarians. But the question that's out there, and it was posed by Dr. Harrop, is, well, if you just wait long enough, these patients present with late myelopathy. And that indeed is a risk, I think, in a patient uh, with a, a stable nonunion. But really, let's look at the literature and see what is the risk. So if we look at that Hannigan paper, no late myelopathy. We look at the Ryan and Taylor paper, no late myelopathy. We look at Hart's paper, uh, Harrop brought this up, it's only five patients, octogenarians, Followed them for longer, though, 55 months, no late myelopathy. So at least there's some studies out there, poor quality, that's showing that stable nonunion, though, is a good outcome uh, with no late myelopathy. Now, some of the papers that were quoted, and Herrick quoted these, uh, looking, at, uh, looking at these pa patients saying if you follow them long enough, they develop a progressive myelopathy. So here's Crockard's paper, but let's look at his patients. So here's the 16 patients from that study, okay? If we look at their ages, though, really only two of their patients were octogenarians. And when did they present? One month after injury, one year after injury. So again, only two out of 16 were octogenarians. They presented very early if they presented late. And look, you know, no weak hands before surgery, so I'm not sure how myelopathic they were in this study. So I don't think this study is representative of a chronic stable nonunion in the octogenarian population, so I don't think you can necessarily use this as an argument against or for the development of late myelopathy in this older age group. The other paper that was quoted, again, looking at type 2 odontoid fractures uh, causing late myelopathy, again, if you look at their 19 patients, only two of those patients had a true stable non-union. The rest of those patients presented with, at least at this point, with instability of C1 and C2. Look at their age. The average age was 34 years. The oldest patient was 68, okay? 
these, this is not a representative study for octogenarians with a stable nonunion. So it's hard to use this data and argue that in your 85-year-old with a stable nonunion, they're going to go on and develop uh, late myelopathy. So again, I think the evidence is there that a stable nonunion is acceptable and a late nonunion uh, or late myelopathy may not be that great of a risk in these patients. So I just wanted to show you a patient example of mine, 81-year-old patient, fall from standing, a lot of medical comorbidities, presents with severe neck pain, neurologically intact. Here's a type 2 odontoid fracture. I don't have all the films. I'm going to go through it fairly quickly, but just to show what can happen. Rigid collar, three months, soft collar for one month. At one year from them, no neck pain, intact, flexion extension x-rays, no movement, CT scan, no fibrous non-union, stable non-union. However, patient falls 15 months after injury. This is the thing we worry about. What if they fall again? Presents back to the ER with neck pain, neurologically intact, another CAT scan, no movement, stable non-union, which you see the patient without a collar. So again, this can be a good outcome in these patients without much risk of late myelopathy, even if they fall again. So the next argument is, is the mor morbidity and mortality. We heard Dr. Harrop say that surgery patients fare much better uh, with regards to morbidity and maybe mortality. I think the thing you really got to worry about in these, in these papers is one, is the significant bias in these studies. Number one is many of these studies don't stratify their outcomes per age. So the outcome in an 85-year-old with an odontoid fracture is going to be different uh, than a 65-year-old, regardless of the treatment that you do. So if they're not stratified, it's hard to look at their outcomes. The other thing to consider is the significant bias in these studies. Again, these are not randomized studies. So you've got operative groups and non-operative groups. Most likely in these centers, the sicker patients, the ones with significant medical comorbidities, the ones that you would predict not, would not do well would be put in the non-surgical group while you'd select the better patients into the surgical group. So you're automatically selecting patients to do better with surgery. I'm not saying that happened, but it's just something to consider when we look at, we, when we look at the literature that's out there. Now, so then the questions we look at. Do patients conservatively manage do better? Do they have less morbidity? Do patients with surgery always do better? So again, let's look at some of the data that we looked at that's out there. Fagan's study, three groups of patients, surgery or non-operative therapy. They broke their surgical groups down to early and late. I'm not going to get into too much detail with that. But what's interesting, they match the age, fracture type, severity score, and comorbidities amongst the groups. This is a fairly well-matched group, you know, amongst the three groups. 64 to 68 non-operative patients were managed in a rigid collar. That's important, I think, when we look at what's the optimal orthotic that's out there. These are collared managed patients. So when they looked at mortality, no different. Okay, so surgery uh, did not reduce the mortality rate here. What about morbidity? Well, no difference in the groups with regards to need for trach peg, development of UTR pneumonia, but significantly less DVTs in the non-operative group and a significant decrease in ventilatory days and hospital stay in the non-operative group. So again, arguing that perhaps less morbidity in the, in the non-operative group uh, versus those uh, that underwent surgery. Smith's Smith study, Harrop talked a little bit about this study. Again, 32 surgery, 40 non-surgery. These were older patients, 85 average for surgery, 87 average non-surgery. So this, is a, this represents our patient population. Hospital length of stay, significantly less in the non-operative group. No significant difference in mortality. Slightly greater mortality in the non-operative group versus the surgical group but not significant, okay? So essentially equal mortality. However, there was significantly more patients experiencing at least one major complication in the operative group versus the non-operative group with a big difference, 62 versus 35. So again, this would perhaps argue that the mortality is the same surgery versus no surgery, but maybe the morbidity is less in the non-surgical group. Um, Another study, um, this is the uh, Showald study, the Chris Bono study. This is an excellent study, just came out 2011 in spine, very well done. 156 patients, type 2 odontoid fractures, older patients, 81 years, 112 non-operative, 44 operative. Just look at the three-year mortality, almost 40%. So again, just signifying this is a bad problem. But if you look at the one-year mortality, the operative patients did better, 21% versus the non-operative, 
36%. So this was the argument Harrop was using, that surgery does better in these patients. But if you look at how they break up their ages, the age of the patient matters. And, and there was a misquote from Harrop in his slide uh, that he may have done on purpose, I'm not sure, but the protective effect of surgery was really only seen in those patients 65 to 74. So you had to be less than 74 to see a protective effect. Uh, when you started to get above 74, you started to lose that a protective effect. And above 85, really no protective effect from surgery. And I copied this right out of their paper just for some proof so Harrop doesn't come back at me. But this is from the, right out of the paper. So we know there's a high mortality in these patients regardless of treatment, operative or non-operative. The mortality uh, increases with advancing age. But here's the most important they note very significant selection bias in the study, so it's hard to make conclusions, but if you at least keep that limitation in mind, the data suggests that it may be protective in those younger than 75 years of age. So there is a role for surgery in the elderly population, but maybe not in our octogenarians. We're probably at that age, surgery doesn't, doesn't pertain such a significant benefit. So when we look at the, the studies out there, there's vast differences in morbidity and mortality reported. The, the literature is biased, both operative and non-operative. I can't argue against that. So, you know, you could argue that the non-operative literature is also biased, but, but it is biased. But I think it's clear when you look at the data, actually how it's presented, that, it's, that it is not true that operative patients definitely fare better than the non-operative patients. I think you've got to really consider the patient's age. Surgical patients have complications. They, have, they code in the recovery room after surgery. They can code. Um, there are differences. But again, I, I do fully acknowledge that non-operative care has problems too. You know, they, they, you're putting them in a collar for a long period of time, they have lung problems. Now, some of this is, is, is better now, especially compared to the older literature. We're not putting these patients on prolonged bed rest anymore. We're not putting them in a halo. So some of these pulmonary issues and other problems are, are decreased. So the last thing I want to talk about is then what is the optimal orthotic treatment out there? And in these slides, I actually stole from Jim, and he's presented them, so I'm going to put them just briefly. But a halo is not the optimal treatment in your octogenarians. We know that if you look at just the halo vest group out of uh, elderly patients with cervical fractures, the mortality is about 40% versus 2% in the, in the yes, less than 65 age. So, again, showing high mortality in these patients managing a halo this study uh, Jim sh uh, showed as well, again, looking at uh, mort morbidity and mortality, 42% in the HALO versus 20% non-HALO. Morbidity, 66% HALO, 36% 30, uh, non-HALO. And this is in the elderly, right? This is 80, average 80, 80 years. So significant morbidity and mortality, difference between HALO and, and non-HALO treatment. So again, probably the optimal treatment is what's been termed in the li literature non-rigid immobilization to differentiate it from a collar, but really a rigid collar uh, is probably the optimal non-operative therapy. All these sh studies have shown benefit of a collar in your octogenarians with a type 2 fracture. I presented the results through this presentation. High rate of either union or stable non-union, low rate of complications, and in many series, lower rates of morbidity compared to surgical fixation. So in conclusion, a dinatoid fractures are common in the elderly. We may be seeing an increase in incidence of them. The literature is weak or very weak in defining the optimal care, especially in those over 80. The literature is very biased, hard to draw conclusions. In many studies, however, the morbidity is lower in patients treated with a collar, especially those octogenarians. Stable non-union is acceptable outcome. There is, however, a risk of late myelopathy. We don't know what the risk is. My guess is it's probably very low. The elderly can be treated with a variety of orthotics. The morbidity and mortality is greatest with a halo. Probably the rigid collar is the treatment of choice. Again, how long to treat them in that, that's always been a question. Um, I don't think that's been defined at all. I think that's up to the surgeon. So on that, I'd like to say thank you for your attention.